Summary. The hexagon pattern. Effects of hills and mountains. Cloud base and minder gap. Early bubble development. This pattern of thermals can also be present later in the day, whilst the lower level of the sky is only weakly unstable, and the only real thermal development takes place at height. This leads to day when the cloud makes the day look good, but it can be a struggle lower down. So in the pattern above, we've got the thermal lift in green, the thermal sink in orange, and the cold descending air hitting the ground and spreading out, represented by the blue circles. That spread out of cold air prevents other thermals being generated close to it, but beyond it they can and therefore you end up with this hexagon pattern of trigger sources. Of course, if we now put cloud shadow in on the picture, depending on the angle of the sun, the cloud shadow can reinforce hotspots. So you have a very even hexagonal pattern of thermals. And here we have such a pattern. And again, this also is this very even, balanced pattern of clouds. The high height crews can have a 5 or 10 percent benefit on cruising lower down. Thermals do expand with height because they comply with the gas laws, but that's no advantage to us when we're turning. Here we have the thermals with gaps between them at 2,000 feet, whereas at height the, reduced, the, the gaps are reduced between the cells and so we actually get a slightly longer cruise in climbing air. Blue day structure is a little bit different. You can get long or short streeting depending on the source generation and the inversion. Radiator effect then. Here we have the hills and we have a huge surface area pointing towards the sun and it's perpendicular to the sun whereas a flat area has got less angle to the sun and so there is less heating. And we can see when we look down on hilly or mountainous terrain very clearly where the sun areas are going to be and where the cloud shadow is and obviously we're going to avoid cloud shadow areas. We get nighttime cooling. We get catabatic winds going down which makes a lot of cold air pooled in the valleys. We can get vario altimeter errors over the hills if we are not extremely cautious. So in this particular point there is a reduction in pressure as we approach the hilltop. The vario will indicate a climb as we go towards it. The altimeter may even climb, but the reality is you're going to hit the top. Thermals can kill ridge lift. In this case, the snow is melting, the water is dripping down the sides, generating a lot of humidity into the atmosphere there, generating strong lift on the sunny side. When we're close to the hill, we'll find that in fact the vortex cannot exist with any kind of interference on the side of it. So the vortex does not exist if it's interacting with the mountainside or hillside. Therefore, you'll fly figure of eight in the air, the warm air which is rising up or humid air which is rising up. You will not make any attempt to turn towards the hillside. 
working the snow line very cold at the top don't eat the yellow snow of course at the snow line is the melt the water will run down gullies and so on onto the hot rock and uh, we end up with thermals being generated from the snow line and here we go here's the thermals at the top of the mountains generated by the evaporating water on the hot rocks below the snow line of course if the mountains are covered with snow you really can't expect to get any lift whatsoever there are altimeter errors over the hills then we know we get a low pressure as the air flows over the top surface of a wing Bernoulli's theory and that's exactly what we get going over the top of a hill like this so here's my cumulus cloud I'm climbing underneath it and I need to be cautious here that the instruments are not lying to me daytime heating then the sun hits the south slope and if the wind is going from that direction as well that is excellent of course once the thermal has or the hot air has cleared the top of the hill then the wind is likely to increase and the thermal will be downwind of the hilltop if the sun and wind are in opposition then the thermal may well break off before even the top of the uh, mountain and uh, obviously drift downwind well clear of the mountain top. Hills do make their own weather. You can see this often in the UK. Here we have an unstable layer. And that unstable layer is very close to the hilltops. Beneath that is an inversion and a stable layer. The wind forces the air up and that air is humid into an unstable band. It makes, generates a cloud and that starts a chain of events which can give you a short or long string of cumulus. Hills do make their own weather. The controlling force is in the sink, ignoring any wave effect. So we can see the sink of the evaporated cloud will fall on one side of the mountain or hill and cascade down into the valley. So the valley is always being filled with cold air. On a blue day, it's not quite the same. The hot air is all, and thermals are all triggered from almost every peak. And there's a general subsidence over the valleys. So here we have a seven knot northerly wind. To the right is the sun and we're romping along about 100 feet, 110 knots to over the hills and far away. So high is not always the answer for going cross country. However, uh, you need to develop some experience and be taught how to recognize that this is going to be successful or you'll be down in the valley in the field. Blue wave shear wave. The thermals may act as an extension to the hills on a blue day and you may get wave above the inversion and it'll be primarily shear wave so it won't extend more than a couple of thousand feet at the most. Wave bubble thermal interactions here we have our wave in a stable layer just above the uh, cumulus and now it starts to interact with our thermals and our cumulus. So here we find that in the downwash the thermals become very ragged and broken. If they are primarily humidity that might survive and climb through and make the cloud. If they're primarily dry then you won't get the clouds and of course they all become very broken. 
So you need a humid day with the wave to actually stand a chance of going thermal into wave. Stress relief. What could go wrong? Well, when we're going flying, we need to make sure we've got no physical stress. So we need to be absolutely comfortable. Uh, food and drink as required. Get sorted. Basically, you should be able to simply get the glider out, rig it, put the batteries in and go. You shouldn't need to be cleaning it, checking the tyre pressures and so on. It should be a ready to go item. Maps and knowledge of the area, knowledge of your instruments, knowledge of the airspace issues and so on should all be sorted well in advance. You have to identify that when you're going cross country you're simply doing something which is normal. It should not be a stressful experience. You shouldn't be worried about whether or not you can make it, whether or not you can thermal, whether or not you're going to have an argument with a farmer. Because most of the time, none of this does happen. The thing is, no one takes off with the intention to crash. So, by all means, have a checklist. Make it as comprehensive as you wish. Always have a plan that achieves the backstop. And the backstop is hitting the ground somewhere safe. Eventualities then. Consider what might be a problem to you. So we anticipate that if the first thermal won't work then we'll have a second one. If the second one won't work then we'll always have the option of the third thermal. When the first thermal doesn't work it might be well we'll go to the second thermal if that doesn't work I've got another thermal but I already know long term long plan if that second thermal fails, I know where I am going to land. Now that could be an airfield or a micro light strip, or it could be an area of farmer's fields that are looking pretty inviting and safe. You get to the third thermal, and again, you've had a closer inspection, because you're getting closer to it, of where you may have to land. And of course, if that last thermal doesn't work, you recognise that you are committed to landing. Target fixation. You can have over concentration on one aspect and miss the big picture. You may have seen the film where you have to count the number of people, number of times a board is thrown between three people, and in the background, is a gorilla dancing around, he appears in the lift and so on. And the point is that uh, it's very easy to get suckered into one aspect and not realise actually there's a bigger danger going to happen to you. So quite often people are high and chilled out when actually you should not be. You've got a long way to go and uh, things can go horribly wrong as you cruise along eating your sandwiches or having your drink. It's a bit like urban driving and uh, going on the bumps. When you are in the city, you have a high amount of attention going on. Of course, on the motorway, you tend, people tend to be way more relaxed. But then when it goes wrong, it goes wrong in a big way. You must never ever enter a situation with no clear safe option. 80% of the information comes through your eyes. So keep looking out. Um, when the Americans had the Harrier, 
they didn't like the idea of buying two seaters and I well recall seeing a, a video of an individual going from the hover to forward flight and of course it is ingrained in us that if ever we're slow or low that we're going to move the throttle lever fully forwards uh, sort of almost unfortunately the nozzle lever is very similar and uh, it's the same kind of action to go forwards you push the lever forwards the same as the throttle of course as he went from the hover to forward flight he moved the nozzles a little bit far forward and there wasn't enough forward speed to produce lift on the wings nor enough vertical thrust downwards to keep the Harrier airborne and so it steadily descended into the runway. Of course the answer is to pull the nozzles back but despite the calls from his instructor to pull the nozzle back the pilot had got completely uh, immersed in the situation of looking ahead and uh, not reacting and not being able to hear what was going on, what he was advised. Of course in gliding you'll find as you become a little bit more tense you start gripping the stick more tightly, the legs tense, you lose feel and you lose spatial awareness of what's going on and you probably see this in the accident reports as well where people end up landing downwind. We end up with tunnel vision. I remember one um, really interesting tale of an individual who was getting a little low and he picked his field, it was a stubble field, and he was delighted because the farmer was ploughing it up and down to, well, I've got somebody to talk to. And this was in the days before we had mobile phones. However, he got a weak thermal and uh, started climbing away but it really wasn't enough with the wind and so he did a few ups and downs, ups and downs and meanwhile he could see that actually the farmer was ploughing more and more of this field and the nice stubble field was turning into a deep plough and the stubble field was getting smaller till eventually he decided no that's it I'm going to go and so in he raced and down on the ground parking just a few yards beam the tractor. The tractor driver came across and congratulated the pilot for such a skilled piece of flying. And the glider pilot in fairness said well actually uh, it's not so much that because gliders land in fields uh, you know as necessary uh, it's quite common and we train for it. He said no it wasn't that it's the way you ducked under the power lines. Well of course this pilot had never seen the power lines. It was purely fortuitous that he'd missed them. We plan with a workload cycle of hop. That is that we have a heading, we have options to try and achieve that heading, and we make a plan. We navigate, so we have a notional track, and why not May plan it with landable areas. We aviate, which is actually climb, because once we're climbing, we can generally relax a little bit. We communicate. Maybe if we're with another glider, we talk to them as to what we're going to do, climbing here or pushing on, and maybe even where we think the ideal lines are ahead. We administrate last, i.e. food and drink as required. And what we need to do is whenever we're flying, always bear in mind, identify what can go wrong and find an early solution. So if there's no good air apparent on track, it is pointless boring down it. Change track. Could be a sea breeze could be a poor line and anticipate that we are going to have a bad line. There will be a requirement maybe to change gear a little bit, just slow down, change gear. If there's nothing on track, get off track maybe towards the lee of hills, lines parallel to the ridge if we're looking for lift. Daily changes. 
Look at the sky at midday, just before you go off on your racing task. What you see is what you get, and generally it's going to stay that way until about 3 o'clock in August, 4 o'clock in May and July, and 5 o'clock in June if there are light winds. The thing is people say, well I was doing great and then I just got out of phase with the weather. Well, the weather will change purely because the sun moves around the sky. So it's a bit like saying I could see where I was going and then it got dark. But we know this is going to happen. As the angle of the sun changes, casting shadows on significantly different ground areas, then the structure will start to change. It's easy to become out of phase. Time from the ground to cloud base then. Be careful what you wish for. A semi-revision. If we have a 2,000 foot cloud base, we end up with 1.4 knot cells. The ground source to cloud base then takes 14 minutes. If we have a 3,600 foot cloud base, we have 3.3 knot cells. And that takes 11 minutes and not too far separated. If we have a 5,000 foot cloud base, we have 5 knot thermals. And it takes 10 minutes. But the thermal cycle will be faster and you'll cruise longer in sync before you get to that next thermal. For a cruising cross country in the UK, hold between cloud base and halfway to the ground and use the clouds. Below this height, you will need to start using ground features to assist in finding your next thermal. So here we have the 2,000 foot cloud based scenario. The clouds are generally about two kilometers apart. Height loss is about 200 feet to the next thermal. If we assume the depth of the thermal is of a bubble is 500 feet, it'll take about one to two minutes for each thermal. So you can hit five thermals in a 1,000 foot glide. You're now at 1,000 feet and five minutes down track. Raising the cloud base to 3,600 feet, we're going to lose about 500 feet to do our six kilometers from one thermal to the next. Depth of the thermal about 500 feet, time taken three to four minutes per thermal, you'll have a moderate cruise and you'll hit five thermals in a two and a half thousand foot glide. So you're now at 1100 feet, you're ten, 10 minutes down track and you might get one more shot of finding a thermal. Cloud base 5000 feet, distance apart about 6 kilometers, height loss from one thermal to the next 750 feet, depth of the thermal about 500 feet, oops so you've ducked under that one time about five minutes per thermal you're going to be cruising faster in stronger sink you'll hit five thermals in a 3750 foot glide you're now at 1250 feet you're 25 minutes down track and actually little chance of making the next thermal thermal strength can be modified by cloud evaporation so here's my cloud base. A little cloud has formed and it starts to evaporate and it sinks within itself. Shallow cloud evaporation kills vortex. You can't get to cloud base. Here we have a moderate depth of cloud and it supports the thermal up to cloud base. Tall clouds reinforce the column, make a column thermal, and so now, of course, these are the best days 
by a long way because it's very easy to pick up thermals under almost every cloud. Beware later in the day. The controlling force when the air is unstable is a huge volume of descending air. As the day dies, the sun goes down. The action of the supporting sinking air reduces. The sky, clouds, look good, but in rea reality the lower structure has collapsed. The cutoff from two knots will take 20 minutes to show itself at a cloud base of 4,000 feet. So here we are, we'll say at 5 o'clock. The sun's just starting to change its angle significantly and the cold air from the evaporated cloud doesn't quite descend quite so far. Here we are at 20 past 5. The sky still looks good, but actually the cutoff is almost a third of the way from the ground to the cloud. And here we are at 20 to 6, and now only the top quarter of the sky is active. Hence the phrase at the end of the day, get high, stay high. Temperature does not always reduce with height. Gliding forecasts also have relative humidity at surface and cloud base. Assuming that any bubble of warm air will cool at 3 degrees a thousand feet as it climbs, then its relative buoyancy will tend purely on the surrounding air at that height. So here we have our thermal on the left in blue and here we have our environmental air on the right. So the thermal is one degree warmer at the surface at 1,000, 2,000 and 3,000 feet. But then there's a little bit of an inversion so at 4,000 and 5,000 feet there's no chance of that thermal at 3,000 feet climbing above to 4. Of course in this case we've got the environmental air at 16 degrees so our thermal at 15 has got no chance whatsoever so there is no instability whatsoever up to 2,000 feet. However the air above that can be unstable and so now we have a middle airspace instability from 3,000 feet to 5,000 feet. And of course if the thermal has humidity therefore it's unstable in both dry heavy air. So although the thermal air temperature is the same as the environmental air temperature the humidity is driving the air upwards. Summary. The hexagon pattern, effects of hills and mountains, cloud basin, mind again.